Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Nick and I do words. I am an avid reader, writer, and a therapist in the state of California, and you have tuned in to my reading blog for The Trader Baru Corporate. Here she is. She is long and intense and terrifying. She's actually not even that long, okay? Let's like clarify this. This book is 400 pages long, flat. That is not bad for a fantasy novel. However, it felt long and it felt like a journey. So I vlogged my reading experience of this, including traveling to Monterey with some friends, doing a book club. Um, and then I also vlogged some of the process of me trying to emotionally process this book and its ending in particular in Seattle with one of my friends. So you'll get to see just some of that kind of fun stuff. This will be a mix of review, critique, Spoilers, I thought this book was excellent, so not that much critique if I'm honest. And general lifestyle content as I moved through the last couple of weeks. In the Trader Baru Cormorant, our main character is the titular Baru Cormorant, who also is referred to as Baru Fisher at times throughout the novel. And her primary quest throughout this book is essentially to take down the empire that colonized her home island of Terranoke from the inside. Hello, I'm here at the park, as you can see, and I'm on page 135 of the Trader Baru Cormorant. I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, we're by a street, but I am really loving this book so far. I'm finding it interesting. I think one thing, aside from the genre that has surprised me, is how unflinching it is when it comes to some of the content warnings. I think maybe in the last couple of years, especially last year, my reading of queer books tended to trend toward books that do not engage heavily with homophobia. Worlds where homophobia is not an issue, is not a thing that people are struggling with, or versions of the modern world that are much softer or that are set in parts of the world, for example, around where I live in Northern California, where homophobia is not something that people tend to encounter day to day on the street. I have my feelings about structural oppression and how that can look, especially in places that are still considered quite liberal. Uh, but in the Trader Baru Cormorant, because this is a story of colonization and empire, there is a heavy theme of homophobia, of sexism, of like heteropatriarchy and tradition, of eugenics, and all of that is hitting really hard. I'm finding that emotionally I'm being really struck by just the heft of these themes that Dickinson has put into his writing. I'm finding the prose really enjoyable. I'm not usually someone who enjoys the like really intricate political fantasy stories because I have a hard time following them, but I think even though there are so many different like factions and names to keep track of here, I'm still following things okay. I think Dickinson does a really good job of having Baru explain herself to the reader in a way that does not feel overly expository, but that still means that I am keeping up with what's going on. I'm intrigued. I'm engaged. I really want to see where this goes next. This story so far is not what I expected it to be, and I am excited to see how else it's going to define my expectations. As Baru continues with this quest, she's placed in the land of Ardwen as an accountant. She has a very high position in this new government and is placed there by the colonizer that originally took over her own homeland. She meets a whole lot of dukes, there's a lot of side characters here, and she essentially utilizes alliances, political savvy, and economic maneuvering to accomplish her goals. She is smart, she is clever, I have more to say on that later, but I found this very engaging. And as you can see, I read a lot of this book in one day, like half of it in a day. Hello! <laughs> I am 220 pages into the Trader Baru Cormorant. I read 190 of those pages today. And let me tell you, 190 pages of the Trader Baru Cormorant feels like 500 pages of like a YA novel or a romance novel. This thing is dense and I don't even mean this in a bad way, like I really enjoyed reading those 190 pages, but the book club is on Saturday and I am getting nervous about my ability to finish. Um, it is Monday, so we're totally fine except for the fact that I have friends visiting, we're gonna be going on a little trip, I'm gonna be like entertaining and stuff, so I'm not gonna have a ton of time to read, however, I'm gonna give it my best. These friends are also doing the book club so we will be able to take a little bit of time to read together but I want to be able to hang out and like have fun and enjoy ourselves so I have to keep reading I have to keep going I wanted to give a quick update and say that the content warnings on this book are legitimately no joke I didn't look anything up before I read it because I tend to have a really high tolerance for most things 
things. I would look them up anyway. Um, I kind of wish I had. I've been okay. I've been fine so far. I'm enjoying myself. I think it's really well written and I think that the realities of colonization and empire are absolutely unflinchingly portrayed in this book. This book pulls from history. Baru Cormorant and the world that she's residing in and the people that she's allying herself with, like they're all indigenous characters in this book. And so we see a lot of horrible things happening to them and to their allies and to the people around them and to their communities and to their families. And it's hard. It's heavy. It's dense. She has a lot of power and you I don't think you can accuse Baru Cormorant of being too kind or empathetic in this book. Um, I'm not spoiling anything as I say this, it's just a really main feature of her personality that the gal is power hungry and she is analytical and she is absolutely not afraid to go after what she wants and needs. This book I also find really interesting in part because the title is so applicable in so many different ways. It is an excellently constructed title. Baru Cormorant plays traitor in so many situations to so many people, including herself at times and including her own agendas and it's really really well done in that way. I think significantly more than the cover uh, which makes this look like a sci-fi novel and it's not. This is historical fantasy anyway. It's fine. I'll get over it eventually. Tour cover team. It's striking. I mean it's beautiful so I can't blame them that much but I blame them just a tiny bit because there are a lot of things in this book that have made me go whoa that's not what I thought I was getting into. I like the side characters a lot in this book and I really like that there are elements of foreshadowing that I totally like am picking up on but I don't know exactly how they're gonna play out so rather than foreshadowing that's either not present enough or I feel like I don't know where we're going at all or I totally miss it or foreshadowing that's a little bit too heavy-handed where I know exactly what's gonna happen and I'm just like waiting for it to unravel. Sometimes that can be satisfying, but I feel like this book strikes a really happy medium between those two where I know what I should be paying attention to and I know that there are certain things that are not gonna turn out the way Baru expects them to, but I also know that when we get to how those things play out, I am still gonna be surprised and probably somewhat, I hesitate to use the word delighted because like I said, a lot of the things that happen in this book are horrible, but they're executed well. It's deft and so, so the dense political machinations, which is not usually a genre of fantasy that I go for, are very satisfying in this story. And so I'm looking forward to seeing how things continue to unravel from here. I did bring Baru with me to Monterey, California, where I took her to see the sights. I thought she needed something beautiful in her life because things are not beautiful in this book. I hesitate to call this book joyless because I don't know that that's necessarily the right word. However, the absolute determination of both Dickinson and the players and characters and the book itself to commit to a really grim, dark tone and a very, very determined, straightforward approach to getting what they want was fascinating and to me felt very at odds with the incredible beautiful scenery that I was surrounded with on this trip. I ended up coming to Monterey with my two friends Brenna and Reed. There they are, my sweet friends, and we stayed in a very nice Airbnb. We did read quite a lot of pages here, however I did not finish the book until we left Monterey. So I got through about 100-150 pages and then had about 100 150 pages left to read after we left Monterey. You can see some of my tabs here. They're very translucent. I tried to match the front of the book and it was an imperfect effort. Aside from just like standing in front of the ocean and filming it, I filmed a fraction of the amount of time that we spent just staring out towards the horizon and the crashing waves. Um, I grew up near the ocean and I find the Pacific Ocean specifically very healing. I love to hang out with her. So it was nice to get that. But aside from just doing this, we did also spend some time going to some restaurants. We ordered in one night. We hung out at the Airbnb and just enjoyed each other's company, we walked around by the parks, by the downtown area, and we did eventually head over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. I have more of that footage in a little bit here. The other thing I wanted to say about Baru Cormorant that I didn't get to fit into my other review segments, even though I said quite a lot of things, is the fact that if you're the kind of person who takes notes while you're reading or is like interested in keeping track of things very carefully, I think this book is extremely rewarding for that. I am not, but my friend Kate is. 
Kate was at book club. And it was really fun to see her notes and the effort that she put into keeping track of all of the characters and their locations and also their motivations. There's a map at the front of this book. And my favorite thing about this map, because I don't reference maps a lot when I read, is that you have handwritten notes, ostensibly handwritten, obviously they're printed in the book, for each kind of location domain, duchy, as they're called in the book. And those notes are ostensibly notes that Baru herself has taken to help her make sense of what is going on here. So they're useful at the beginning and they're useful throughout. Taking a clip okay. of me with the ocean. Do you want to be in it? Yeah. Are you trying to be in my clip? Oh, hi! Hi! <laughs> <laughs> The trip to Monterey did eventually have to end. We headed back to Brenna's house. She very kindly, her parents, I should say, very kindly allowed us to stay there. I got this amazing boba and we went to Filoli. Beautiful gardens. Oh my goodness. I ended up writing. I didn't end up reading that much of Baru here, though I did read a little bit. My friends read a little bit more than me. I decided to sit down and write because I was just feeling inspired by the greenery. It was absolutely stunning. I currently am in a place where I'm waiting for my associate number before I can start working, and I feel so, so fortunate that I'm able to do these beautiful things with people that I really care about while I wait, as opposed to just sitting on my thumbs and doing nothing, because I hate sitting still. I love reading. Reading is the way I sit still the most. And then we went to book club. I didn't film a ton of book club because I have friends who understandably don't love their faces being on the internet. So just look, look at our nice table, look at our drinks, look at our fun that we had. It was a beautiful conversation. I had so much fun at book club. Hello, today is January 31st. I finished the Trader Baru Cormorant a few days ago. I don't have a ton of really great footage of me finishing the book. <laughs> I literally only have this clip. which I did take immediately upon finishing it, and then I had to like lie down. I, as I was finishing the book, was making noises like a kicked animal. Like I was whimpering. I didn't know I could make noises like that. <sighs> I'm trying to pull my thoughts together and it's very difficult, even with a few days distance, even after our book club meeting, which was so much fun and also such a great, like connecting way to talk about a book like this that's so intense. It was such a relief to be able to kind of dump out some of those feelings. There are six of us that do a book club. Usually we do sapphic sci-fi fantasy. Um, it depends on the book and it depends on what we're all trying to do. Uh, we're actually doing a book that is not sapphic at all next. We're gonna be doing Babel by R.F. Kuang. But for the time being, our Baru Cormorant book club was intense. All of us had, I think, similar reactions to the end of the book where we think it probably ended the way that it should have and also it was devastating, heart-wrenching, nightmare-inducing, miserable, excellent. <laughs> it's really hard for me to express how much I loved this book without also letting you know that I, I haven't been so emotionally ruined or devastated by a book in a very long time and I've read some very very good and affecting books in the last year. Okay, an important thing to know about the Trader Baru Cormorant is that it deals in colonialism in a different way than a lot of other books do. I watched a review by Amrita, who I... what am I doing? I've linked her video in the description. I highly recommend watching it. It is a very incisive and clever review of this book, and it talks a lot about the fact that this book is about the mechanisms of colonialism and not about individual evil people. Uh, one of the things that she wrote in her review was that the idea of a big bad is a safety blanket. In this book, the Empire, the Falkrestian Empire, comes to Baru Cormorant's hometown and begins taking over economically before they do anything else. Then the children are enrolled in a re-education program. It's very upsetting to read, and also you can see how it happens step by step by step by step. One of the major themes in Baru Cormorant is the idea of a long game. 
I'm not gonna get into spoilers for this book, so just as a, an FYI, really, really loved the long game theme in this book. I thought that it was powerful, I thought it was well executed. It's kind of a motif in some ways, but more so structurally and thematically as opposed to like imagery. Baru is a gal on a mission. <laughs> if you're looking for a simple hero, if you're looking for a main character that you can uncomplicatedly root for, you are not gonna find one in this book. I need to pick up the second book and eventually the third. I'm not ready for that yet. I think I'm probably gonna read it in like March because this the sheer intensity of this book bowled me over. The content warnings are graphic, they are intense. I talked about this earlier on. They do not let up throughout the book. I would consider this like a grim fantasy. It is dark, it is bleak, and it is absolutely unceasing and relentless. Which is not to say that you can't find some delight in the prose and how well executed these things are. Dickinson writes battle scenes and he writes about economic maneuvering as if they are dances. It's very beautiful, it's very deft. It makes it interesting to keep going even though you get a lot of telling and not necessarily so much showing. If he showed everything that happened this book would be like 3,000 pages long so I totally understand why some of that shortcutting was necessary and I think the shortcutting was executed in a way where I was still interested in reading these lines and finding value even though it's like oh yeah this is how this person dies what the end. <sighs> I'm gonna have more to say very soon, but I just wanted to talk about this while the book is still fresh on my mind. Hour 33 minutes, that's from takeoff to touchdown. Pretty nice day up in Seattle, winds out of the east, seven miles per hour, mostly clear skies, temperatures 34 degrees. Thank you for bearing with that abrupt segue. I had no good way to transition into my Seattle trip where I visited my friend Molly. I spent pretty much the entire four days that I was in Seattle processing Baru. I mean, we had fun. We hung out. We walked around. Uh, we went to a bookstore that you'll see soon that was so nice. But I was thinking about Baru Cormorant. I was thinking about the epic tragedy that this book is. I was thinking about how much I liked it. Uh, I got a reprieve from that here at Elliott Book Company beautiful location. It was enormous. They had a really, really great selection, I thought. Um, I actually ended up in a corner reading the first half of the first story in Bliss Montage by Ling Ma, which is high on my list. I want to read more short stories this year, and I loved this. I'm going to see if the library has it. I only ended up picking one book from Elliot Book Company, and that was a nonfiction book. Uh, I was also reading Seven Days in June on my phone from the library, but I picked up Intuitive Eating. It's been on my list for a long time. And like I said, I thought and I thought and I thought about Baru. I told my friend Molly all about this book. I explained why I liked it so much. And I found that with every single day that passed after I read it, I liked it more. And I have a feeling that that's going to keep happening. That happens with my very favorite books that I've ever read. Uh, and it also happens with books that I started at like a three-star rating and they've just gone up and up. Hex by Rebecca Dynerstein Knight is one that comes to mind. Um, Baru Cormorant did not start as a three-star book, but my goodness, it has climbed in my rankings. So it was a very short trip with a very short turnaround, but I really appreciated it not only as a chance to spend time with a friend that I don't get to see very often because she's a bit far away, but also as a chance to sit with my own thoughts, process stuff, and prepare to get home and film the rest of this vlog and talk more about Baru Cormorant, but also redo my background, my backdrop, and just breathe, think about what I want February to look like. I planned out kind of my TBR for February, more on that soon, and I just enjoyed myself. I wanted to wait to film the rest of this review, like my final thoughts, until I finished my new backdrop, which I'm very happy about. I think it's looking very nice. I set it up for work from home and I think it's going to be a really solid professional, but still like personable and personality filled backdrop for me. And also, again, I said this previously, but I needed to process the ending of this book. I like this book a lot more sitting here right now than I did when I finished it over a week ago now. So. We are still talking about the Trader Baru Cormorant. Uh, I do still have all of my tabs. I don't know how easy it is to see them. I'm hoping we've kind of focused in up there. I have quite a lot of them. I color coordinated them to the front of the book, but these tabs are super translucent, so it didn't work perfectly. However, I'm still happy with how it came out. I don't know that I'm gonna give a star rating to this book ultimately. I I think it's a five star book and it's wild that I don't even know that I can for sure say that because for me so often what makes a five star book a five star book is the fact that I'm yelling from the rooftops about the fact that it's five stars specifically but when I'm yelling about this book I'm not yelling about the fact that it's like fun. <laughs> 
this was not a fun book. I do stand by the fact that if you're not in a place right now where you want to read something intense and violent, this is not a book to pick up right now, and that is completely fine. I said before we started reading this that I was scared of this book, and I wasn't sure why. And it's so funny now that I think about it, because I was right, but I did not understand the extent to which I was right. If I can leave you with anything from this review, it's the fact that this book is the most impactful thing I have read in a very long time. It is one of the most impactful pieces of fiction I have ever put into my brain through my eyeballs. Seth Dickinson gets it. He gets it. He absolutely gets it. This is a book that is morally gray, it is complicated, it forces you to make up your own mind about a lot of stuff that's happening, and also it forces you to cope with what's happening in the same way that Baru is trying to cope with what's happening. You, as the reader, are getting pulled into all of this imperialism and colonialism, this violent colonialism, this absolute takeover of a land, the toppling of dukes. You are being thrust into this world, and the fact that we get to see the machinations at such a minutia level I understand why people found this book boring or maybe less exciting because there are so many descriptions of battles and of economic maneuvers. I get it. The fact that we were so in the weeds with all of that, though, to me, is one of the most masterful parts of this book, because I had to cope with everything that was happening. I had to cope with the soldier whose intestines were spilling out of his body. I had to cope with the people who were losing everything because the economy had crashed. I had to cope with the ideology that is so, like, masterful and beautiful, being held by someone who just wasn't able to keep up politically with the rest of the people that are in this book. Like, This book pushes you to develop an understanding of yourself as a human being who has to cope with what's happening in this book. It held up a mirror to me in a lot of ways, and for that I'm really grateful, honestly. And like, don't get me wrong, this is not a perfect book, but I like it more because it's not a perfect book. I will say in terms of stuff that's perfect, I do think the back of this book is like one of the absolute best knockout synopses in history. If you're thinking about reading it, absolutely go find the synopsis right here. Check it out. Read it. I picked it up in a bookstore because I'd heard a lot of things about it. Again, I'd heard it in the same conversations as other books I really love, like A Memory Called Empire, like the Locked Tomb series. I've also heard it more recently discussed a lot in relation to The Unbroken by C.L. Clark, and that's a book that I really want to read, actually, especially now knowing that it has a lot of ties to this one, that we've got like a morally gray lesbian character who's dealing with colonialism, who's native, who's trying to like take down this imperial power. Love that. I'm loving it. I'm loving that theme in these books. I think that's actually... I've said a lot that sci-fi fantasy, and fantasy specifically, is just like not my genre in the way that a lot of other genres feel like they are. I consider myself more of like a literary person, despite the fact that I read all over the place all the time. You would not be able to guess that <laughs> just by looking at my channel, I think. But this kind of sci-fi that is really examining systems and systems of oppression and systems of power and the way that we play those against each other, that is my jam, actually, I'm realizing, especially with sapphic characters, especially when you're looking at different, like, cultural elements. Seth Dickinson is, uh, I wouldn't say come under fire necessarily, but there's been some critique of the fact that Baru is a woman of color and a lesbian written by a white dude. I think all sides of this argument have merit to some degree. I also think that if you read the book, you will get that he gets it. I think Baru was a spectacularly written character. I think this book is spectacularly well done. I'm at a point, I think, in my life where if somebody gets it, I'm rolling with them. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get it too. <laughs> and that is fine with me. And in terms of bringing a more psychological element to it, as I like to do with reviews, I do want to talk a little bit just about the experience of reading this book. I'm going to talk on a meta level about the fact that I felt like I was drop kicked through a flaming basketball hoop of emotion into a swamp that was also on fire and was like consuming me and then I was burning. It was a lot! <laughs> it was a lot to read. This book didn't make me cry, but it did make me make a lot of horrible noises. Like a lot of horrible noises at my friend's house in front of her mom. I'm so sorry to my friend's mom, who I was making horrible noises in front of as I finished this book. I talked about this in my Get to Know the Book Talker video, so if you haven't watched that, I'll link it in the description. You can get to know me a little bit better as a person and as a content creator, but I don't personally often like to read for escapism. I don't pick up books for escapism, really. I try really, really hard to build a life that I don't feel like I need to be escaping from all the time. And this book absolutely is not an escapist book. It is immersive, and I think to the degree that we are escaping into another world that we feel like we're part of and that we feel invested in and we feel like we can witness through our senses, 
absolutely this book could be considered escapist in that way, but if we're talking about like departing from our worries and entering a better and more beautiful world where everyone is happy all the time, or if they're not happy then they will be happy by the end because there's always going to be this resolution that feels really satisfying, this is not your book. This is not your book. And I feel like this exemplifies so much of why I often am choosing not to read for escapism. People talk about this a lot with nonfiction as well, I think. This idea that we should be reading difficult histories, that we should be consuming... I don't even like the word consuming there. The idea that we should be taking in stories that are not our own, even if they are stories of brutality and trauma and pain, because that helps us understand the circumstances that we find ourselves in in this modern day and age. So I think Baru Cormorant really rooted me into our world, even though this is a sci-fi novel. So this is like a high grimdark fantasy novel. It's not high fantasy, I'm lying to you, I'm so sorry. Hard fantasy is the word that was used I saw in some other reviews, so we're gonna use that. I wish you could see how much footage there is of me just staring at this book. Not even just trying to think of what to say, but just having a moment, needing to take a moment. <laughs> oh baby. I didn't film a lot of my sitting and staring. <sighs> anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that when it comes to reading hard books, whether they are fiction or nonfiction, if those books contain challenging themes that are in our lives, whether we ourselves as individuals are experiencing these things or not, we are going to be tested with our ability to cope with the reality of that situation. We can use coping skills with books as we would just like in our lives. If we read something really horrible, then we often will like cheer ourselves up in some way afterwards. And while I think it is totally beneficial to like learn about coping skills and go to therapy and get some ones that are going to really work for you, I also think a lot of us have innate natural coping skills that we can lean on. We have our own innate resilience that we can just figure out and listen to and pay attention to. I needed a break before I started sitting down and like breaking down each thing about this book that I loved or that I hated. I didn't really hate anything, but like hated with the connotation of it made me scream. And I took that break and now that I'm sitting here, what I really want to talk about is the fact that this book is hefty, it is important, and I'm gonna be thinking about it for like the rest of my life probably. This is not a book I'm gonna forget about, this is not a book with characters that I'm gonna forget about, Baru and Tainhu especially are going to stay in my mind. I'm excited to pick up the next book but I'm not gonna do that right away because I know myself and I know that I'm gonna want time to percolate. So I will be picking up the monster Baru Cormorant eventually, I will then likely later also be picking up the tyrant Baru Cormorant, and I'm gonna find strategic times to do that when I am feeling up for the challenge because not only do I think it's good for my own emotional well-being to pick up books that are gonna like match my vibe <laughs> as best I can but I also think it's good for the experience of the book itself I don't think Seth Dickinson sorry to speak for him would want me to pick this up when I'm already feeling like tormented by stuff and then feel more tormented and just be miserable and brain spiral I want to be able to sit down enjoy the craft and the mastery of this work even if I'm not having quote-unquote fun with the events that are happening therein. So ultimately, The Trader Baru Cormorant is a brutal, beautiful piece of literature that I would hands down recommend if you feel like you're up for it. And I don't mean to say this is like a challenge. Please don't read this out of spite if you also don't think you're up for it. <laughs> Though if you want to read it out of spite and you feel like you're up for it, I would love to hear what that experience is like. And I also think this is an important book with morally grey, sapphic characters, the likes of which I never got to see when I was young. I read a lot of queer books because I didn't really get that experience when I was growing up. They didn't feel accessible to me, there were certainly less books, but there were some when I was young. They just didn't feel like things I was allowed to pick up based on the community that I grew up in. So I feel like I'm making up for lost time and the sheer complexity of these characters makes me feel so grateful. I don't need a happy ending. I don't need a happily ever after I'm waving this around. <laughs> I don't need a happily ever after for a good queer book to be a good queer book. And this is a good queer book.